So good to see all of you. We were, of course, gone last week. Thanks to Dan Enright for doing a great job. Let's give him a hand. I want you to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. Before, uh, before we do that, let me, uh, first of all, I want to introduce to you some of our new members. And this is, again, exciting because God is bringing new people our way, people who add value to our church, people just like you guys who um, are such a blessing, people who have heard about our vision and our mission, and they say, hey, put me in, coach. I want to be on this team, and I want to join you guys in what, well, what God is doing here. So I'm going to call your names, and when I do, I want to invite you to stand up, please, because we want to welcome you. First of all, Betty Ruth. Where's Betty? I saw her. There's Betty right there. Remain standing. Stephen and Vivian Thompson. Let's pray. For, uh, thank them for being here. Angela Hogan. Here's Angela. And Aaron and Lynette Nelson. There they are right there. We truly welcome you guys. Thank you for joining our church. Thanks for being a part of us. And now this is your church home, okay? This is your church family. And so we want to welcome you. Thank you. Be seated. All right. Also, Ron Haley has asked me to tell you that if you have ordered a book from his brother, when his brother was here on Veterans Day, uh, the book, the CDs are available now. They were on order and they're available now in the lobby. Okay, so Luke chapter 2. We're going to look at the experience of the shepherds today and think about what was it like to be there on that night when those shepherds were out in that field. What an amazing experience they had. And so we really don't have to look long or look hard to see that their experience was one that was filled with, first of all, fear. And this is the idea that we're going to look at today, the fear of God and overcoming the fear of God and releasing our fears of God. It's exactly the experience that these guys had. And, uh, you know, Christmas is a time for many things. It's a time certainly for us to uh, enjoy family and friends, uh, sometimes put up with family and friends, cousin Joe and Uncle Billy and uh, you know, embrace them during the Christmas season. Uh, it's a time to go shopping, and there's busyness associated with that. Um, it's a time to get relationships right. I read, I read a cartoon this week about Lucy and Charlie, and Lucy went to Charlie before the Christmas season and said, listen, Charlie Brown, Christmas is coming up, and I think because of Christmas we should kind of rebuild our friendship and get our relationship right, and let's be friends during the Christmas season. And Charlie Brown said to her, well, Lucy, that's great, but why just during the Christmas season? How about all year long? And Lucy turns to Charlie, you know, with that face that only Lucy can make, and she says to him, what are you, some kind of fanatic? <laughs> I guess it's fanatical to love people all year long. But nonetheless, Christmas is a time for us to, to think about things a little bit differently, and certainly it is a time to draw close to God. And there's an inherent fear that many people have about God and toward God. And that fear is based upon many things. We fear God for many reasons. First of all, we, we can fear God because He's all-powerful. God is huge. And God is powerful. And he is mighty. And he has created this universe. And God, in one sense, is scary powerful. I mean, the God who could bring this world into existence just by merely speaking it into existence is a God that is not to be trifled with. And so God is big, and He is intimidating at times, and He is powerful. Next, he, he is holy. He is righteous. This is certainly true about His character. God is holy, and He is righteous. And sometimes when we look at our lives as compared to God's perfection, and, and we do this comparing and contrasting between who He is and who we are, we get this sense of, wow, you know, it's a little bit scary relating to God because by right, He should judge me. And by right, He's probably not pleased with me. My attitudes and actions do not reflect this true and holy and righteous God in heaven. But then also, we can fear God because He is so unlike us. God is a spiritual being. He lives in eternity. We don't. He is infinite. We are finite. Uh, he, he is in the company of angels. We are in the company of kids. 
and bills and a job and a life and hardships and challenges. And sometimes what grows in our mind is this idea, well, God just doesn't understand what it would be like to be me. I mean, after all, he is God. I am not. And how can he identify with me? And that can create a fear in our lives and a distance in our lives away from God. And certainly the shepherds were there that night, there on on that special night, on that silent night. And they individually, I'm sure, had fears of God too. But in this experience, it moved past a fear of God to a terror of God. So let's look at it in Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. It says this, and in the same region, now, in order to understand that, you have to look back to the earlier verses in chapter 2. Now, remember the gospel of Luke. Luke was a physician. He was a doctor, and he was writing as a way of describing accurately the history of what Jesus experienced in his life here on this earth. So his life and his ministry were being documented by Luke. And so Luke is trying to, with great accuracy, describe the Christmas experience. And so in the beginning of chapter 2, Luke is talking about the experience of Joseph and Mary, where Joseph, being warned in a dream, takes Mary, his pregnant, soon-to-be bride at that point, from Nazareth to Bethlehem in order to protect her and to protect the child. And so that's the region that is being talked about here. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory, listen to this, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Now, a night of fear for those shepherds. Look back in verse 9. Let's look at some of the words used here. It says in verse 9, the glory of the Lord shone. That, that verb is used only one other time in the scripture. It's used in Acts chapter 9, verse 3. And if you're familiar with that passage, you know that that's the experience of Saul, that great persecutor and oppressor of the church, who was converted into being a Christian, and ultimately became the most tireless missionary of the Christian church, the Apostle Paul. Formerly Saul was riding along on his stallion, and God decided he was going to get his attention. And the Bible describes a great light from heaven flashing during the daytime. And that light was so great, it knocked Saul off his horse to the ground, and it blinded him for three days. That's the kind of light, and that was in the daytime. That same word is used here for this light that shone around the glory of these angels at the time when they appeared here to these shepherds. A very, very bright light. The sky lit up and these guys likely fell flat or they ran and the sheep were scattered, maybe never to be found again. And their eyes were not adjusted because it's the middle of the night and they're watching over their sheep and this great, terrific light shone there before those shepherds. It reminds me of a time when I was in high school. It was either my junior or senior year in high school. And I, I was raised in a place called Weatherford, Texas. It's kind of a ranching community. It's gotten bigger over the years, but back then it was pretty small. And I was outside of Weatherford, actually, at a friend's house. We had just arrived at his house, and he was out in the middle of a ranching area, nothing around, pretty dark. And we pull up into his driveway, and we're walking from the driveway into his house, and all of a sudden, there in the darkness, a huge light passes over us. I mean, it was a burst of light. And of course, our immediate response was to duck and to kind of run, and that's what we did. And then we look up, and we see that it's an F-16 jet, which was cruising at a low altitude. And after the light went past us, the boom of the jet engine was felt. Not just heard, it was felt. It was awesome. <laughs> and I'm like, I got to get me one of those, you know. 
I mean, it was this amazing experience, one that I've never forgotten, that just terrified us in an instant like that because of the suddenness and the brightness of it and the boom that occurred. And I can imagine that night for those shepherds and the still of that night when darkness broke and a bright light shone around them and an angel announced that a Savior would be born. And then it says down further, then suddenly, along with that angel, suddenly a multitude of angels. Now, when the Bible describes multitude, it means hundreds. It could mean thousands. Imagine this. Hundreds, if not thousands, of angels appearing there in the sky, announcing the news at Jesus' birth. What a night that was. And the shepherds were struck with great fear. You can imagine. It's interesting the word that Luke uses in this, in this verse for fear. It's actually a couple of words combined. The same Greek word from which we get our word phobia. Puts two of those words together. And so what the Bible is describing here, it could literally say, and they feared a big fear. They feared a great big fear is the idea. Some translations have said, and the shepherds were terrified. So the experience of the shepherds that night was one that was initially filled with fear. Fear of the supernatural, fear of the suddenness of this event, certainly. But also fear that God had arrived. They knew that this was a divine moment because the angels were proclaiming that Messiah was going to be born. And so there was inherent in this fear of the miracle of the event, certainly a fear in relationship to God. Now, here's the amazing thing about Christmas. The Christmas message should actually, actually erase all of our fears of God, not cause fear of God. Now, there's a, there's a healthy respect of God. There's a healthy fear of God. A healthy respect of His, his deity, a healthy respect of His power, healthy respect of his authority, that's all good. I'm not talking about that kind of fear. That's the kind of fear that we should all have. I'm talking about the kind of fear that leads us away from God rather than to him. A fear of his inherent, impending judgment upon our lives. Though if it were not for the Christmas message might occur, but the good news is that Christmas alleviates our fears of God and releases our fears of God. It should. And so let's talk about why. Why can we release our fears of God, about God, during the Christmas season? I think there are four reasons found in this passage. First of all, because the message of Christmas is a message of good news and great joy. It's not bad news and sadness. It's good news and great joy. Verse 10, and the angel said to them, fear not. Now, this is the same phrase that was used all throughout the Christmas narrative. It was the phrase that the angel said to Zechariah there in the temple. He said, do not be afraid, fear not. It was the phrase that was uh, said to Joseph by the angel when his plan and his purpose in the Christmas narrative was announced to him through the dream. The angel said, do not fear, fear not. It was the same phrase that was given to Mary. With the news that she would bear the Son of God. The angel said, fear not, fear not, fear not. It's all over the scripture. Fear not, because what is happening is not bad news, it's good news. There's a lot of bad news in the world today. But the inherent good news is good news of great joy. That's the message of Christmas. I think inherently there are people who fear God, fear coming close to Him, fear knowing Him, allowing Him to know them, fear of entering that relationship. They, they inherently fear God because they feel like God's got bad news for them. They feel like the only news that God could share with them is some bad news. Now, when I was a teenager, not attending church, not having a relationship with God, not knowing who Jesus was, I had a fear of God. It was a fear that God wasn't really happy with me. And 
You know, it's kind of like Ron said one time, you know, I leave, I leave him alone, he leaves me alone, we're okay, right? That's, that's the way it kind of worked. But inherently, what I did not understand that ultimately was shared with me is that God has some great news for them. And the content of that great news is really found in the last part of verse 10. And we miss it. We kind of read past this. Look at the last part of verse 10. It says, it is good news of great joy that will be for what? All the people. All the people. So the angels are saying it's not good news for just good people. Here's, here's the rule we kind of inherently understand. Good things happen to good people. And everybody gets what they deserve. That's not the Christmas narrative. That's not the Christmas story. We don't get what we deserve. We get grace. We get mercy from God. That's the good news. So it's not good news just for good people. It's not good news in that context just for Jewish people. It's not good news just for righteous people. It's not good news just for religious people. It's not good news just for church people. It's good news for all people. And guess what? You're included in all people. And so am I. It's good news for all of us. See, the thing that makes me afraid is when I think uh, seeing God someday and I think of all the things bad that I've done. And the angel says, I've got good news to you. And that good news is not based upon your behavior. It's in spite of it. It's not based upon what you've done. The good news is based upon what God is going to do. So you don't have to be afraid because it's good news of great joy. Why? Why is it? Well, it's good news of great joy because it is a message of a Savior. That's the second thing. That's the second reason that we can release our fears because it is good news that is a message of a Savior. Look in verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who, by the way, is Christ the Lord, who is God himself. A Savior is born. And so you have to inherently ask, if God is sending a Savior, what is he sending a Savior to save us from? From what are we needing to be saved? Saving means to be rescued, means to be delivered. And it implies that there's some kind of threatening condition, right? If I'm drowning, I need to be rescued. If I'm in a car accident and I'm trapped, I need to be delivered and rescued from it. I need to be saved from it. So what is the idea of salvation in that phrase, the Savior? Some people would say, well, it means being saved from unfulfillment. Because after all, my life is kind of unfulfilled. Life just hasn't worked out as planned. You know, I didn't really get the job I wanted and not always really happy with my wife and the things that she says and I don't have as big a house as I really wanted to have in my life and I don't get to vacation in Cancun like the Jones family gets to do you know life is just kind of unfulfilling and so people think Jesus has come to fill the holes and to make life more prosperous That if I believe enough, I'll have more health, I'll have more wealth. Some people would say, no, Jesus has come to save us from bad things. In other words, if I come to Jesus, no more bad things will happen to me. I mean, after all, my marriage is bad, my job is bad. Jesus is here to fix all my problems. That's what it means for him to save me. (laughs) The problem with that kind of thinking is that not everyone feels unfulfilled. And not everyone feels that bad things are going on in their lives. Jesus didn't come just to fill holes in an unfulfilled life. He didn't come just to fix and prop up every problem that you have. Now, certainly there's a measure of fulfillment that results from coming to Christ. There's a certain measure that life tends to get arranged properly when in submission to his word, his instructions, we by faith put our trust in it. Life tends to work out, certainly in better ways, but that's not the primary purpose of Jesus coming. It's not to fulfill you and it's not to fix your problems. Your problem, my problem, is the problem of sin. We need a savior Jesus came to rescue us from the consequences of our sin. Our sin stands between us and a holy and perfect God. 
our willful sin, our subconscious sin, whatever it is, we stand guilty before a holy and perfect and righteous God. And here's what we tend to do. We tend to overestimate our goodness and underestimate our sinfulness. Let me give you an example. Let's say that you are a really, really good person. And um, let's say you were so good that you only sinned three times a day. Wow, you'd be practically a walking angel, wouldn't you? Three times a day, only three times a day, said a, said a bad word, had a bad attitude, did something that was wrong, only three times a day. Well, at the end of one year, you would have sinned, what, over a thousand times. If you lived to be the average age of 70, in the span of your lifetime, you would have sinned over 70,000 times. Now, what do you think a, a judge here on this earth would do if you came into a courtroom with 70,000 traffic tickets? He'd throw you in jail. He'd throw away the key. God is much more holy and righteous than any earthly judge. And our problem, folks, is the problem of sin. We stand guilty before God. We need a Savior. That's why God sent a Savior. Jesus came for that purpose, to offer us forgiveness for sin. Somebody once said, if the world needed education, God would have sent a teacher. If the world needed an army, God would have sent a general. If the world needed more money, God would have sent a banker. Although there's not too much money flowing through banks right now. If the world needed forgiveness. And so God sent a Savior. This is the good news. This is the good news of great joy. That because of Christ, we have a Savior who can now offer the freedom of forgiveness. That we can approach this holy and righteous and perfect judge. Not based upon our goodness, because we're not good, but based upon what Jesus did for us. This is why the angels were praising. This is why they were shouting from the skies the good news about Christ, because they knew what that moment meant. In eternity past, God decided he was going to break through heaven to the earth to send a Savior. They understood fully, maybe better than anybody else, what that moment with was. Because they were with Christ in heaven before the incarnation. They were with him there. They knew his glory. They knew his majesty. They knew his riches. They knew his purity. They knew his righteousness. They knew him. They knew about the fall of man. Back in Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve, by their disobedience, by their rebellion, sinned and rebelled against God, and sin entered this world, and from that point on, the hammer fell, and we lived in a sin-stained world from that point on. The angels knew about that sin in the garden. They knew about the sin of people since. They knew about the sacrificial system. They knew about all those lambs, and all those doves, and all those pigeons that had been sacrificed in the altar throughout centuries. Animals sacrificed, blood spilled over the altars, and they knew that those animals could never take away sin. They knew. And they knew that Jesus would die for sins. They knew that he was born to die. They knew that he would bear the curse. They knew that he would take the punishment of the very ones that he was sent to. And they were praising God. Because they were seeing God's grace on display. They were seeing God interrupt that history in order to send a Savior. Glory to God in the highest. That was the message. It's a message that there is a Savior. Next is a message that God is with us. That God is with us. Look in verse 12. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Isn't it amazing to you that this God that is so big, that is so powerful, this God that cannot identify with us, is God who was born as a human baby. The most meek and mild, born in the most meek and mild of places, in a barn, laid in a trough filled with hay, displayed to the most meek and mild people on the earth, mere shepherds. It is the stooping of God. It is God bending from heaven and earth, the condescension of God. 
placing God himself there in the context of humanity to wear flesh and blood, to be like us, to face hunger and thirst, to face disappointment, sometimes sadness, to face, at times, frustration, to face temptation, God walking among us. So it means that God is with us, and God could have chose many ways to come to this earth. Think about it. He could have chose many ways. He could have dropped down a rule book. He could have, he could have sent a king to conquer. He could have sent a general. He sent a baby. It says something about God to you and me. That God identifies with us. God is with us. And then I need to finish up. The next thing here is that God has given us, through Christmas, a message of peace. It's a message of peace. Verses 13 and 14. Suddenly, here's the word, suddenly, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest. And on earth, here in this place, Peace among those with whom he is pleased. You've heard it said before, peace, goodwill toward men. That's an accurate translation also. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. The best reading would be peace among men of his good pleasure. Or put another way, peace among men of his good will. It's not, if you're careful, if you're not careful, you'll read it incorrectly. In other words, peace among those who deserve it. That's not the reading. It's peace. Peace among those whom God has shown his pleasure to. Not because it was deserved by them, but because of God's good pleasure. It was his pleasure to give it, is the idea. It was his good will to give it. Peace on earth. And so what happens through Christmas is that you and I now have the power in a relationship with the supernatural God who can remove conflict from our lives. Internal conflict, relational conflict. Were you saying that he's going to make every relationship right, that every relationship is going to be restored? I'm not saying that. What I am saying, though, is that within you, the conflict produced from the relationship can be absolved. You can find in your heart forgiveness. You can find in your heart freedom from resentment. You can find in your heart freedom from the desire to get revenge. You can find peace within. Peace, that's a result of our relationship with God. Christmas means the absence of conflict between God and man. Because Christ was born, a Savior was born, He bled, He died for our sin, he was resurrected in power. And because of that, we can be made right with God. Folks, your greatest need this morning is not to get your spouse to agree with you. It's not to get your kids under control. It's not to get your job straightened out. Your greatest first need is your relationship to God himself to make it right to experience the Savior. And the result truly, truly is peace. Um, Travis Tritt is a country singer. You guys have heard of Travis Tritt, right? Travis Tritt tells a story, and I just read it this week. Before he made it big, he spent years and years, a long time, singing in small little bars and nightclubs and playing his music. He describes one night how some people who were drunk there in the bar, he could see that there was an argument breaking out and that men were turning, squaring up against each other, about ready to fight. And he describes, while he was playing, seeing this kind of thing going on, and while he was singing, and all of a sudden he kind of stops, and in this moment of inspiration, he began singing Silent Night and playing Silent Night. And this was July. It wasn't December. And he says, it's amazing 
just when the fight started to get out of hand and I could see bikers reaching for their pull cues, I started playing Silent Night. It was the middle of the July. I didn't care. Two people began crying. And I was standing there watching peace fill the room. That's what Christmas does. It offers peace. 1 John 4.18 says, There is no fear in love. What a powerful phrase. There's no fear in love. But perfect love, the Apostle John says, perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, is what it says. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We don't have to fear God. He is all-powerful. That's certainly true. Yes. But He came in the meekness of a baby. To say, you don't need to fear me, but come to me. He is, he is holy and he is righteous, yes. But that baby that was born in the manger grew up to be a man and lived a sinless life. And one day, he was cruelly executed as God for the sins of the world. That baby died for sins committed by you and me. So while he is holy and righteous, the punishment of our sins was placed upon that baby in the manger. And because of that, we need not fear. God is not like us. That's true. He's eternal. We're not. But God wore flesh and blood. He walked this earth. He spoke our words. He lived in human flesh. He became like us. To identify with us. See the angels were shouting from the sky. And Christmas. The message of Christmas is as loud as ever. God is shouting from the sky. That there is a savior. He is Christ the Lord. He has done everything. Everything. To show you his love. Sending his very son. Everything. That's the message of Christmas. Come to Christ. Fear not. Grow close to Him during this season. And may peace really reign in our hearts. Let's stand for closing prayer. Father, we praise you, we thank you for a message that has been recorded and kept for us about some people out in the field, men that we'll never know the names of, but whose experience tells us today that we need not fear God. So help us to draw close to you during this season. Whatever reservations we have, whatever doubts, whatever complexities there are, whatever that stands between us and you, whatever needs that we think keep us from you, Lord. Help us to overcome. Instead, embrace the simple message that Jesus, the Savior, was born. Thank you for that reality in the middle of all the craziness of this season, Lord. May it resonate in our hearts and minds. And may peace rule the day. That's my prayer for our church. Make this season one of peace. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all.